Hi everyone, welcome to another episode of Restoring the Past. I'm really excited about this one. We're going to change things up a little bit, um, but I'm going to be doing a little series here. I spent some time in Japan and I'm uh, going to do a little Japanese series on a couple of uh, great things that I saw there. So first up is uh, an absolute must uh, for anybody interested in antiques, arms, and armor. Uh, so this video is going to take place at the Oyamizumi Shrine, uh, located on the beautiful Omishima Island in Japan. The collection in the shrine uh, is just remarkable. It houses over 80% of Japan's national treasures in terms of antique arms and armor, which is just phenomenal. So really it's kind of a, an all-in-one uh, stop really for, for enthusiasts of, uh, of antique arms and armor. There's dozens and dozens of swords and suits of armor. One of the swords is over six feet long, and uh, the oldest in the, in the collection dates back to about 950 AD. So some really old stuff, and, and what's kind of cool about it is because it was just an offering to the shrine after battle and things like that, you can really see the weapons battle damage. They've got chips, they've got scratches, and uh, you can see where sword-to-sword -sword contact was made and things like that. So these are not your, your finely polished specimens that you'll normally see in the museum or on display at uh, very nice uh, exhibits and things like that. So it's you're really seeing the sword is kind of how they were presented at the time and, and left at the shrine, uh, which is really awesome. Unfortunately, I didn't get any good photographs or any good video footage of the weapons that are upstairs. Uh, they're pretty strict about no photographs, so I wasn't able to get anything other than that one picture that you can see of the, the collections of swords and part of the Naginata. But I was able to get some amazing footage of all the armor that are located downstairs in the lower portion of the museum. So for those who uh, aren't able to make the trip themselves, uh, hopefully this is about as good as it gets. Let's take a look. Wow, when you look around, and everything is old, even the display cases. You know you're not in Disneyland, but the experience is going to be twice as good. Immediately, you can see that these are something special and something you'll never see outside of this museum. See the quality and the age of the armor that's on display here. And as one might expect uh, with so many national treasures uh, housed in one area, uh, you know, there's some really famous uh, items that belong to uh, some very prominent samurai, such as the, the Minamoto brothers, Yoritomo and uh, Yoshitsune, really, really famous samurai, as well as uh, Kono Michinobu from about 1190 and Kono Michinari from about 1281. Uh, some really great stuff. Uh, I think Yoshitsune probably um, the most famous uh, of these warriors, I guess, arguably, uh, you know, just kind of take your pick. Uh, but, uh, you know, he's very famous for defeating the, the legendary warrior monk, uh, Benkei, who yielded a, a halberd or a naginata, as they're called in Japan. Uh, that, that naginata is also here. Uh, so you can see that. And, um, and there's even a suit of armor that belonged to uh, a female samurai, Tsuruhime. It was a 16-year-old girl uh, from Omishima, and uh, she was a very uh, famous samurai uh, princess. So that's pretty cool. You can It's a rare chance to see what, uh, what a female samurai would have worn into battle. And Tsuruhime, uh, she was born in 1526, so uh, right in the middle of kind of that warring states period in Japan. You know, I saw a lot of, uh, a lot of brutal combat as uh, daimyos and different warlords kind of struggled to uh, to control all of Japan and unify Japan and uh, she kind of has a, a tragic story as you can imagine being born into those times. So I won't go into a whole lot of detail on the armor uh, that we're seeing here. I mean obviously you can tell it's a, even for the samurai it's an older style of armor, an older style of kabuto that you see. Uh, kabuto means helmet. Um, you can tell these things um, just by looking at the lacing, how it's laced up in the armor, uh, some of the leather tooling, uh, the larger sode, uh, that's those kind of shoulder guards that you see, how they're very, very large, and those kind of acted as, uh, as a samurai's uh, shield. A samurai never, never had shields or anything like that. And you have to remember these people were 
depending on, on the period in which they fought, but uh, certainly at this time, around the 12 to 1300s, uh, which a lot of this armor seems to be from that time period, they were predominantly fighting on horseback and they were archers. And uh, if you think about it, when you draw back a bow, you know, you can just kind of do it at home there, but then you're drawing back a bow. And as your shoulders sweep back, as you're drawing uh, that bow strain back, those two large shoulder guards will form uh, at the back. So it will kind of sweep around you and make a giant shield uh, on your back. Uh, so that just gives you an extra layer of protection uh, when you're kind of darting in and out of the enemy and, and shooting your bow. Uh, so very, very practical function, uh, though so they got smaller as time went on. Japanese armor isn't something I get to work a lot on. I've done a few pieces. Uh, they, they come to me occasionally. Um, I've done some work on the kote, which are kind of the army guards, the do, which is kind of like the, the breastplate, and some sode. Uh, Japanese armor brings a different set of challenges, uh, as one might ex expect, uh, opposed to European armor. Uh, the materials, you know, the lacquer work, the silk lacing, uh, the leather tooling, all these type of things uh, have their own unique set of challenges. Uh, but whenever I get them, it's always a, a real pleasure. And the chainmail is different as well. And uh, I'll probably make another video on that. I can help explain a little bit uh, a lot of the major differences between the Japanese armor and European armor. I hope you've enjoyed this episode of Restoring the Past. Uh, like I said, it's a little bit different uh, today. And uh, I'll be doing uh, a couple more uh, on a similar theme of uh, Japanese uh, episodes here, uh, covering different aspects of historic arms and armor and uh, different historical Japanese matter, uh, which I hope everybody finds interesting. Uh, so not a restoration project, but hopefully uh, you found this, uh, this video helpful and informative. And uh, as always, uh, I greatly appreciate the help and support. And uh, thanks a lot. Please subscribe.